What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. We're going to be ending off the week here on Friday with a decision by Judge Nathan. She ruled on the outstanding post-trial motions that Gillen Maxwell had filed. Basically, her last-ditch effort to try to overturn her convictions or to get off on a couple more technicalities. Now, there is some limited good news for Gillen Maxwell because a couple of her charges were dismissed. Two charges were dismissed. Uh, but nevertheless, she's still facing 35 years in prison. So I'm going to be detailing everything here. Uh, and summarizing what happened. So this is the decision that was put out by Judge Nathan, very comprehensive, discussing everything that happened at trial. She went through the main arguments uh, in these motions that were made by Gill and Maxwell's side. Almost all of them were denied except for one motion for multiplicity. So the most important post-trial motion for Gillen Maxwell was the second one, where she asked under Rule 29 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure for the judge to acquit Gillen Maxwell of all the charges because they claimed that the government had insufficient evidence for any rational juror to find her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, of course, the judge denied this because this is just hilarious. <laughs> There's mountains and mountains of uh, witness testimony as well as financial records and other types of documentary evidence that was presented presented at trial. All of that completely goes against this. Of course, a rational juror can find her guilty, which is why she was found guilty on five of the six charges. Okay. And they asked for other things as well. They also claimed that the prosecution delayed trial, which is hilarious because <laughs> Gill and Maxwell's side filed so many ridiculous motions during and before the trial, especially before trial, the very gall of them to claim that the government prevented um, a speedy trial is just hilarious. So those are just two of the ridiculous things that they asked for. The judge went through and covered all of their requests, went all the way through it and explained why she was denying each and every single one of them. And in her conclusion, she summarized the entire document by saying the following, for the foregoing reasons, the court denies the defendant Rule 29 motion because the jury's guilty verdicts were supported by the witness testimony and documentary evidence presented at trial. The court denies the defendant's motion based on constructive amendment or variance because of the jury instructions. The government's evidence at trial and summation all captured the core of the criminality charge in the indictment and the defendant was not prejudiced by any alleged variance. Further, that because the government neither intentionally delayed its prosecution, nor was the defendant prejudiced by any delay, the court also denies the defendant's motion based on pre-indictment delay. Again, they're the ones who uh, delayed the trial by filing a thousand different unnecessary motions. So the balls on them to, uh, to claim that the government delayed things. Hilarious, hilarious. Uh, finally, the court grants the defendant's motion to multiplicity. The government concedes that count one is multiplicitous with count three, and uh, the court further concludes that count five is multiplicitous with count three. Count five, like counts one and three, charge the defendant's participation in the same decade-long unlawful agreement with the defendant's uh, continuous conspirator, Jeffrey Epstein, to groom and sexually abuse underage girls. Accordingly, the court will enter judgment of conviction on counts three, four, and six. So basically, she removed two of the counts uh, from the indictment because they were uh, multiplicitous. And you cannot have multiple uh, charges against a defendant because that violates their Fifth Amendment right against double jeopardy. And the judge explained that here in the middle of the document or in the beginning of the document when she went over in detail exactly why she was removing these. And I want to read, read you guys this. This is law. So the judge has no choice but to dismiss these charges. Uh, it doesn't make a sentence. Uh, it doesn't make it that much of a difference for sentence. Sentencing, she's still going to get like 25, 30 years uh, in jail, most likely leaning towards 25. But we'll see on uh, June 28th, I think she's going to be sentenced. But anyway, she's still going to get 20 plus years in prison. That's the point. Uh, the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment guarantees that no person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. That's from the U.S. Constitution, which is law, law of the land. And the judge is constrained by the Constitution and the judge uh, and the government concedes that some of these charges are repetitive. So this is happening because even though uh, charges one, three and five that were, they were talking about refers to different victims, it still essentially ties back to the same criminal conspiracy together with Jeffrey Epstein. So technically speaking, according to the Constitution, you cannot charge her multiple times for the same conspiracy. 
That's why the judge has no choice but to dismiss two of the charges because they're repetitive. OK, so this is the law and the judge is constrained by the law. OK, an indictment is multiplicitous and therefore implicates double jeopardy when it charges a single offense as an offense multiple times in separate counts, when in law and fact only one crime has been committed. So even though these the, the different uh, charges in the superseding indictment, which you can see here, they charge uh, they charge her for um, for her activity with different girls. So victim one, uh, victim two, victim three, victim four. Obviously, we had four different girls here that they talked about. Even though it refer it may refer to different minors, it's still the same underlying criminal conspiracy. That's why the judge had no choice but to dismiss the dismiss two of the charges. She's still getting uh, charged on three counts, and uh, the counts that that still stand are enough to put her, put her in jail for more than 20 years. Um, so count three has 10 years max attached to it. Count four has 15 years and count six has 10 years as well. So overall, there's a max of 35 years. According to previous judgments and what the prosecutors are likely to recommend, she's probably going to get something like 23 to 26 years. That would be my guess. But it obviously depends on what the judge thinks is, is appropriate. The judge will look at the pre-sentence report that we that will be produced by the prosecutors and she will be making her decision on june 28th and lastly here i want to give some credit to the lawyers for gill and maxwell because they actually made a coherent legal argument which they haven't been able to do through this entire process all their arguments have been crap for the most part but this is a pretty good argument so I didn't take this argument seriously because I thought because of the fact that it refers to multiple uh, victims that you can charge her separately. But I but it's a very good constitutional argument that the, that the Gill and Maxwell side is making, saying that it all ties back to the to one criminal conspiracy with Jeffrey Epstein. That's what the judge had to concede. And according to constitutional law and precedent in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which the judge cited here in her decision, um, this is technically correct. But nevertheless, she's still being charged on uh, these three counts. The trial was valid. All the other, all of her other post uh, trial motions were dismissed because they were ridiculous and she's still guilty. Okay. So nothing has been overturned, um, but two charges have been dismissed based on constitutional grounds. We have no choice. The judges had to follow the constitution. So no matter how much we may not like it, that is the law. Okay, but nevertheless, there's nothing to fret about because she's still going to be spending most of her life in prison. So that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I think it's a good way to end off the week. Mostly good news. She was not able to dismiss her in, uh, her conviction, which is the main thing that they were asking for. And she's still in prison. She's going to be in prison for most of her life. So thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press all for future videos. And if you want to support my work, you can do so on Patreon. There'll be a link in the description box down below. With that being said, I'll see you guys next time. Have a good week weekend. Peace. Gentlemen, the great hall of justice is now in session. Bring forth the accused. <laughs> Members of the council, today I have received evidence that two innocent newsmen have been murdered by a senior judge. Judge Dredd. How does the accused plead? Not guilty. And let the trial commence. They're calling it the trial of the 90s. Mega City's greatest hero has been charged on two counts of murder, and the evidence sure looks damning. Born in 2066, Joe Dredd was cloned from the genetic material of the first chief judge, Judge Fargo. Having proved exceptional at the Academy of Law, Dredd graduated two years early. In 20 years of service, he's played a key role in public affairs, most notably during the Robot Wars. <laughs> All right, mechhead, download this. Armor piercing. Armor piercing. And his recent mercy dash across the cursed earth. The thousand mile nuclear desert between Mega City 1 and Mega City 2, inhabited only by mutants. I've got a lot of people counting on me. I ain't gonna let some free headed creep stand in my way. Engine on. Running. He's a lean, mean justice machine. He saved the city time and time again. The big question now is, can he save himself? <laughs> <laughs>